Hi there, welcome to the Accidental Pop Star here on YouTube. My name is Ali Beg. I am a former sports broadcaster, an author, and I was a member of 1990s boy band Bad Boys Inc. We were signed to a and Records between the years 1992 and 1995, and we had relative chart success across the world before we went our separate ways in the spring of 95. The experience and my path and what was a fleeting brush with fame certainly changed the type of person that I was and the type of person that I strive to be. So, what's the idea behind this channel? I'm going to be interviewing pop stars, both past and present, about their own experiences and their own path. And is having a number one record and being on the front cover of Smash Hits magazine, everything that it's cracked up to be. And talking about number one records, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome to the accidental pop star, Chesney Hawks. We are going back to 1991. Chesney Hawks spent five weeks at the top of the UK charts with the brilliant, the one and only. It wasn't just a huge hit in the UK, it had global success as well, including America. But after that, Chesney found chart success difficult to come by. So let's try and find out why. He's a brilliant guy. He's got a fantastic story. Welcome to the accidental pop star, Chesney Hawks. Chesney, it's fantastic to see you and to meet you. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. So we've got a lot to get through, but I would like to start yeah. right back at the beginning um, in your childhood. Were your parents, did they encourage you to have some sort of career in the music industry? Did they push you towards that? Um, well, first of all, um, thanks for having me. And it's it, uh, it's a dream to meet a bad boy. So um, <laughs> my parents, uh, yeah, my, they didn't push me into it. Although, um, you know, my dad, uh, you know, he, he came from a rock and roll background um, and, uh, there were guitars propped up in every corner and dad's friends were all 60s superstars like uh, Jerry Marsden from Jerry and the Pacemakers and, uh, you know, the, the Marmalade and the Searchers and, you know, Dave Dozy, Beaky Mick and Titch. They're all like friends of my dad's, you know, so I kind of grew up around music and fame. Um, and I, dad always says I came out singing, you know, so it was kind of obviously in the blood. I, I was playing gigs as young as 12, 13 um you know with a band but i also used to i used to be the piano man in local pubs you know from the age of like 14 15 i'm sitting in the corner playing billy joel songs and stuff like that so you know i i don't think dad needed to to push me i had very 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 much i was a very tenacious um kid as far as uh you know music goes and and I, i've never had a proper job you know i I went straight into it and and jumped in for, um, feet first and uh, and never looked back. Really, was there a time when you thought, Do you know, I really want to have a crack at this? I think I'm quite good at it. Yeah, I, I, as I, I was quite precocious. I knew I was good. You know, um, that's something that that I was very. You know, I look back now. You know, as a as an older man, and and I and I'm like, wow, I really I, I was precocious. I like. <laughs> I had that kind of belief in myself, you know, um, which I guess wanes after a while as you get older, doesn't it? You know, yeah. it's because when real life kind of hits you between the eyes and you have to dust yourself off and pick yourself up all, <laughs> all these different times, you know. But back then, um, I, I almost felt I had this kind of like silver spoon in my mouth in a way, like, you know, well, I'm going to make it. Of course I am. I, this is, I was, I was born for it. You know, it's like I just had that feeling. Um so um so when i eventually did get a, the the elusive record deal and and uh, you know eventually you know put a record out and then it was successful i was like yep that's what you do and uh, this is what happens when you put records out <laughs> you know little did i know ali little did oh, i know yes. oh yes we'll come to that <laughs> in just a moment <laughs> can you explain the process of how you actually signed your record deal with chrysalis yeah, well, that came about because I, I auditioned for a, a lead part in a film with Roger mm. Daltrey called mm. Buddy's Song. Um, and it was like one of those kind of X Factor style auditions with hundreds of young boys. And Roger was looking for a young boy that could possibly be his son, right age, um, and could sing, play guitar, play piano. And I was like, 
I can do all that. Never acted before in my life. Um, and uh, I just went for the audition. And listen, I was very, very lucky. Um, and the stars aligned for me in that respect. And I, I was lucky enough to get the part. Now, it was about a young singer songwriter and very musical based film. And so a record deal actually came off the back of that. Mm. I had before that done the the classic you know made written a bunch of songs and and made a demo on a cassette and sent it out to all the record labels and been turned down by all sorts of people you know uh all those people that were now fighting from to, to sign me <laughs> because I had this film behind me you know it's just one of those classic music business stories I guess and uh yeah so so eventually when we signed we signed with uh with Chrysalis um, there were a couple of other labels, you know, wanting to, wanting it, but uh, we went with Chrysalis. Yeah. Did you have a manager during this time? Well, yes. Um, at the time, um, my dad was managing me okay. from right early on, um, and then once uh, once I got the part in in Buddy's song, um, I was co-managed by my dad and Bill Kerbishley, uh with Trinifold Music, which you know they had the Who. Led Zeppelin and me <laughs> and Bill. Um, I don't think Bill ever really knew what to do with me. You know, I, uh, he was the one that got the deal. He's, he's an absolute legend in the music industry. You know, uh, he, he, he'd been around for a very long time and he's one of those kind of old school, um, managers, you know? Uh, and, and, uh, so he was very much, um, kind of like you know arm around you my boy you know he's one of those guys and uh i mean great i had good times with with, with them but i honestly don't think he he knew quite what he had with me you know because when when i was eventually kind of uh uh being managed and and uh properly managed and the record was being made and you know the image and everything else was being you know portrayed as it were um I was kind of pushed into that pop star thing. I I, I always thought to, that I wasn't really that. I was like, well, I'm a, I'm a musician, you know, I'm a singer songwriter. And uh, there were songs that I, I'm probably answering other questions here. But there were songs uh, that, that I wanted to record that I'd written that, that for, you know, from the management point of view, they thought was too kind of grown up or too not not pop enough, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So there were many songs that I wrote in through those days that were very close to my heart lyrically um, that uh, maybe just were a little too grown up and they just ended up on the shelf gathering dust, you know. <laughs> it's really interesting because uh, just forgive me while I just slightly indulge myself here just to put this question into context. Um, Chesney. Yeah. I remember when we signed our deal. So we signed in May 1993 with A&M Records. Yeah. And we sat down in the boardroom, we signed the deal. And then I kind of wondered what would come next. So is anyone going to sit us down and sort of advise us and tell us what the roadmap is going to be for us? This is the plan. This, this is what will happen on a month to month basis. But none of that came. And it yeah. was almost like we were just going along for the ride. And it always baffled me why the, there didn't appear to be a roadmap. Mm. Did anything like that happen with you? Did anyone actually sit you down and say, right, this is what it's actually going to be like? No, uh, I never had any of that. It just suddenly kind of was upon me. Obviously, there were people involved in the record label, uh, all the people that, you know what it's like, you, the the head of promotion, the, the head of the label, whatever, even management will now and again give you the little chat. This is going to be a bit mad. You know, you're going to have this happen and that happen um, and give their own kind of two two pence in. Um, but no, as far as a roadmap goes, um, I honestly don't think they even knew. Um, you know, what? The, I think they were just chancing it and probably the same with you. They were like, you know, Four good looking boys we've got a good record here uh, let's just uh see what happens with the first single and uh and then we'll you know we'll see what, then maybe we'll put another one out and then yeah. then we'll then we'll stick the album out you know i don't think i mean in a way i understand that because it is kind of hard to to plan from the very beginning of a career because uh, you don't know what's going to happen you know it's like if you know what's going to happen with it if, if everybody knew that you know my first single was going to be a huge number one all over the world and blah 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 perhaps you could actually plan something uh and go okay so once we're done with that then then we're gonna if once that's been that successful <laughs> then this song should probably be the second single because it's 
I don't know, similar, written by the same person, you know, produced in the same way, blah, blah, blah. But no, none of that happened. And because me, I was a little bit different because the, my first album was the soundtrack to the film. Yeah. And the record, the one and only, was kind of a standalone thing. It was kind of a last minute, um, you know, we found the song, it was Nick Kershaw had written the song and it was very different to anything that was on the on the record so it was kind of hard to fo to follow up with something on the album if you know what i mean okay so how did that whole process work of you getting that song because did were you sent a demo of it did you have to go down to nick's studio and meet him how did the whole thing happen um we had finished recording the album um, and it really was the songs from the film. And it was so much so that like the guy that um, Nigel Hinton, who wrote the book and the screenplay, the lyrics were all his. I had a bunch of songs that I I put music to. There was other people. Um, so the, the that record had a specific sound and a specific story and a tale. So the one and only came along because the record label were like, yeah, we love the album. Um, this is great. But may, maybe we should look for, you know, maybe a couple of other songs to kind of help with maybe a single, that, you know. And so it was put out there, you know. So I was with a major record label. There's loads of people trying to get take, give songs to us. My dad knew a guy called Stuart Newton uh, with at Warner Chapel um, Publishing. Mm. And it was an old mate. And uh, he went and had lunch with him. And Stuart played him a couple of songs. And he said, what do you think of this? And it was Nick Kershaw's version of the one and only and a couple of other songs. And um, and he's like, oh, well, that's obviously Nick Kershaw. Is that a new, is that a new Nick Kershaw album? Chess will be happy because I was a massive fan. And uh, <laughs> it was, so he came, brought it back to me. And I was like, oh, my God, I, I can hear Nick Kershaw's songs before they come out. I was literally a fanboy. And I, that, my main kind of drive for wanting to record that song which I still have on cassette, but I still had that same cassette and I've got a little asterisk by the one and only and an asterisk oh, yeah. by a song, another song called oxygen. And there was a song on there that Cliff Richard ended up recording called, uh, I'm in love with my TV. <laughs> no way. And Jason Donovan ended up recording, uh, oxygen. So I took the one and only and, um, yeah. So my drive was to kind of, I wanted to meet Nick Kershaw. Yeah. So, you know, my dream came true. I mean, he was a bit of an idol of mine. Human Racing is still one of my favorite albums of all time. And uh, we were recording, we were still recording like the album, the rest of the album uh, at Abbey Road. And uh, Nick came down and I got to meet Nick at Abbey Road and he co-produced uh, the record, which was basically him bringing his files from the demo uh, pretty much. And, uh, and kind of loading it into the whole Abbey Road studio setup and, and, you know, enhancing it and and making it the record it was. Do you know what's really interesting is um, to ask the question, did you ever actually get involved in the production side of it? Because mm. we were very new. We had no sort of musical backgrounds. We had mm. absolutely no experience in the industry whatsoever. Very, very manufactured. But mm. I remember going in and getting <laughs> what was our debut single, and it was the demo. And I was like, okay, this is actually quite cool. I, I like this. <laughs> yeah. And then our producer got a hold of it and put his own stamp on it and his own style on it. And then we heard it and I was like, what's happened here? And mm. that was my, it's just a personal thing. And I'm, you know, I'm not being disrespectful to the producer, but it just, every time I heard a demo track and then heard how he had put his own stamp on it, mm. I was always left flattened disappointed and i'm just wondering had... did you actually get involved in the production process or you were a bit like well it's nick kershaw i don't have to <laughs> uh, a little bit of both actually um, okay. and uh, there is and there also is a thing uh, called demoitis which i'm sure you've heard of before yeah. which is where yeah. you, you know the song's first written and there's an energy to it when you first record it that is very very difficult to reproduce uh, sure. when you end up recording it and so you get you fall in love with the demo and then when you actually record it, you're like, yeah, it doesn't have the same kind of mm, yeah. feeling to it. Yeah. You know, yeah. I still get that all the time. Um, yeah, I was there the whole time. Um, 
through throughout all the pr production um, of all of all of my records. I mean, I've co-produced some of the, my own stuff uh, over the years as well, and I'm now a producer and I produce young artists as well. So, so yeah, I've always been very much into it, and and uh, you know, I come from a musical background. Uh, you know, I play guitar and piano, and uh, so uh, I'm always I've always been interested in how records are made and how they're put together. Um, so I kind of insisted on being that. Not that I needed to insist. I just I was just there, you know, I was there for, for everything. And, uh, uh, Nick, you know, is one of those people and maybe I'm just because I'm a fan and maybe because uh, I've seen him work. Uh, he's just, I, I would trust him with my life as far as musical stuff goes, you know, it's like anytime, um, I, <laughs> Anytime we've written songs together, and we have written hundreds over the years, we're, we're actually really good mates. And, uh, you know, he's had songs on um, my albums and I've had songs on his albums. Um, but like if Nick, if Nick is, I can't be there for whatever reason when, when he's producing, I, I always love what he does. So he's like in a, re a very, very rare situation like that, where you, you, you know, you have 30 years of experience with this person, trust and, and, and I just always love everything he does, you know, which is so rare, as you know, it really is. Mm. But I've been in that situation that you're talking about where, you know, a producer, producer will come along and they want to put their own stamp on it. And, uh, you know, sometimes you don't, you don't have to do that. You, you, you know, you, you take the essence of, of what is beautiful about this, the song and, and, uh, and if the demo is good, you you don't you don't completely turn it on its head you know you you utilize what what it is about that and the, and the soul of what was good about that and you just make it a little better you know you just kind of fill it yeah. <laughs> but uh... I, I always felt we lost the essence of the demo and that was a thing that that, yeah. that, that to this day still irks me a little bit yeah. um wrong producer i'd say yeah, that, that, yeah, yeah. It's uh, we'll come, we'll come on to it. We'll come on to it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Just staying on the topic of the one and only. Just before the release, how often did you rehearse? Uh, you mean for live? Yeah, for live for um, TV shows. Just getting the band. In I never rehearsed for TV. Really? Never rehearsed for TV. Um, but I, but then I had a live band, uh, you know, even before I got the part of the film. So like, you know, my brother is my drummer. Yeah. Um, I had a, a guitarist, Gary Nuttall, who's now with, he's been with Robbie for uh, the last twenty five years. Um, is a, uh, you know, we grew up together, and he came along the ride on the ride with us, you know. So I, I'd always, you know, I'd always played live, and um. We were obviously rehearsed for the big tours, like when when they all kicked off, and suddenly you're like, oh, you're going on an arena tour, or you're you're playing stadiums with Brian Adams, or you're going on tour with Huey Lewis, all that kind of stuff. That which I did, all of that stuff. Um, of course, we rehearsed, but we didn't rehearse any more than like you know a week, ten days, or something like that. Um, and because uh, we we're a bit more of a kind of a plug in and play band, you know, we're just like you know, I play guitar, you know, you you're on the bass. It's like just plug in and off we go, you know. Um, for TV, never, because we're not. We weren't like you guys were slightly different. You, you yeah. probably had dance moves yeah, and we were visual. And, yeah, yeah, you were more visual. We were a bit more kind of rock and roll, I guess. Yeah. Um. So we didn't really need to 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 rehearse for TV. We just kind of did it. Yeah. Okay. See, at the time of the release of the record, did you personally understand how important it was to get radio playlists and certain television shows to to help? sell the record and did you actively get involved in any of the promotion that's a very good question man I, uh you know n the, the answer really is no not at the very very beginning okay i was i just put all of my eggs into the, the thinking that the that the well they're a big record company and you know they've got blondie signed to them they, uh, you know uh of course they know what they're doing um i very very quickly understood it um, and when I, when we put the, the one and only out, there's a story behind that actually, the answer to this question is that like when there's a thing called the midweeks, which you probably remember, uh, every Wednesday or Thursday, uh, yeah. the midweeks came out and it's basically a prediction of where in the charts that record is going to, is going to be. And, uh, towards the, the kind of middle of the campaign to get the one and only going, um, I think we were just outside the top 40. We were like 53 or something like that. And then the midweek said we were like way out. It was like, you know, 85. And so when that normally happens, 
a record is dead and then the record company pulls the plug money gone it's over so that happened on the thursday or wednesday or thursday and then on the saturday night uh we were booked to do the little and large show (laughs) <laughs> which was a Saturday night cabaret entertainment. It always had 15 million viewers or whatever, you know, at the time you wouldn't think of it as, as a, as a TV show that could break an artist or whatever, but we did it that, that week and bless them, Sid and uh, what's his name? I can't remember now. Eddie. Sid and Ernie. Yeah. Eddie, wasn't it? Eddie. It's Eddie. Sid and Eddie. Yeah. 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 Helped us and put us in the top 40. You know, that's what did it. That is what put us, into top 40 so the one and only could ne- it possibly have been never even have happened if it wasn't for for the little and large show so then that was a, a kind of a, a real lesson for me like yeah it's so important to have those kind of things yeah. you know where you, you wouldn't expect it but so you, you've you've gone in so how did how did the momentum work to get you to number one because did the radio <laughs> yeah. pick up on it um did like for example top of the pops pick up on it because if you you know me if you get top of the pops you're guaranteed a hit record um so how did the process work can you can you recall it i appreciate it's a long time ago but can you yeah it's a bloody long time ago now yeah I, i think what happened once it went into the top 40 um there was a definite shift in uh in the feeling you know it's like i yeah and it very quickly actually rose. Um, you know, I think it was like, I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it was kind of like, it came in at like 37, 17, 5, 1, you know, so it was like, a wow. and um, yeah, I, I remember being on, I, st- I what happened was all the TVs wanted me um, once it got into the top 40. So I did like live and kicking, you know, and I did like the 815 to Manchester. And suddenly I think what happened was, for me, uh, I think the whole heartthrob thing happened. I got the I got the young girls, <laughs> you know, and that's what because they, they they were like you know the people the kids that were buying singles at that time, and and I really think that's what that's what did it. And uh, I remember being on uh, the eight fifteen from Manchester with a group. Oh God, it was two black girls. I can't remember the name of the uh, uh, artist. I oh, wish I could remember, but. Our midweek at that week was was number one, so we were five, and the midweek was it's number one. And I was talking to these girls, um, and God, I wish I remember the names. And uh, yeah, so she she said, "So what's your midweek?" I was like, "It's one." She was like, "What? You're number one in the midweeks?" You know, it was like, and the, I remember her reaction kind of made me think, "Oh shit, yeah, I'm gonna have a number one record," you know. And then that same week. That same week, I had a meeting with Bill Kerbishley, you know, management, a couple of the record label people, my dad and everything. And we were in his in his uh, uh, office and he said, right, I really hope this isn't the number one, guys. And me as a 19 year old kid, I just kind of. I just thought, what the fuck are you talking about? Of course, I mean, isn't that what we're here for? And what he was getting at is was, you know, it, it's going to be really, really difficult to follow it. Mm. and and then have a kind of a i don't know a, a, a long you know elongated career you know that uh that you manage carefully you know i guess that's what he meant it's going to be really hard because then suddenly you are the one and only and that's it you know it's like really difficult to follow a debut single that is that that huge you know just quickly when it got to number one you know, the highest we got in the charts in the UK was number eight. And mm. the elation felt at the time was incredible. I know now it's completely different to what it was back then. You know, I think we sold 65,000 records in one week and we only got to number 10. And then we got top of the pops and we kicked on to number eight. And it was just it, the the feel of relief was massive because we desperately needed a, um, a hit record at that time, <laughs> even though we charted with the with the other three. So I don't know what it feels like to get to number one. Can yeah. you just try and explain the emotions when you know, officially, not midweek, but officially, it's going to be number mm. one? Yeah, I mean, what I remember of that time, um, for a start, um, it, it really was a, a marked shift difference from being, you know, 
I'm putting a record out. We're we're having fun here. I'm doing TV shows. Blah blah blah. When I got to number one, suddenly it was like there were fans everywhere. Girls camped outside my house. Um, you know, I I couldn't go anywhere um, at all without getting recognized so it wasn't just that the the record was number one it was like that i suddenly was fucking famous <laughs> you know i was like everywhere and i was on the front cover of every i think at that point when i was number one in the uk for those five weeks i think i had more number one sorry more front covers on the, the teen magazines than like new kids on the block for instance it was like it was so ridiculous and such that's when um, I explain like the eye of the storm. Like I, I suddenly was thrown into a very, very different world. Like you know, um, it was a lonely place in a way, yeah. um, because I was. It was kind of on my own, uh, and everything around me was just like, you know, and and of course, when you have that kind of success and you're making money for the record label, and suddenly they see pound notes and whatever they they. they they push you into everything. And so suddenly I was like, I would, there was one day that I did seven countries in one day, you know, so you are worked to the bone, you know, and there was a time I remember I was in Japan and uh, in the middle of an interview and, and I stood up and literally fainted. <laughs> I was just 19 year old kids. So I was, you know, healthy and fine and everything else, but obviously I'd been worked right to the edge of my physical that I could possibly do and I just I was just gone mm. you know and I see I see that happen to artists now like I remember like happened to Adele when she first broke you know and suddenly she just she had to cancel shows well it happened to Robbie when he had his you know massive success you see it Harry Styles same thing um they're not you're not prepared for the madness that ensues you know it's it's, it's really quite uh quite wild you see the same happened to us very quickly and again, looking back, we were not ready for it. We were not prepared for it. As individual people, we all coped with it yeah. differently. But nobody sat us down and said, right, you're going to be famous. And I'm like, okay, so define fame. And how is that going to change me? What do I have to do? And how do I mm -hmm. have to handle it? There was the, there's no course to do that. You can't just go online and no, say- No, you can't pick up the handbook. Exactly, there's nothing there. <laughs> and at first, I got to be honest, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was yeah. hugely flattering and it was a buzz. But I have to also be very honest, Chesney, and tell you that it very quickly started to irritate me and I became more and more uncomfortable with it. How did you cope with the adulation? I think uh, I think I probably got a little bit too big for my boots, uh, you know, to, to start with and and had to be kind of reeled in a little bit by my, my little brother who was drummer in my band. And and I actually mentioning Jody, um, he definitely kept my head, uh, you know, from kind of going in the clouds and kind of because, you know, he'd be like, don't be such a knob band, <laughs> you know, and uh my my kind of uh, relationship with fame back then, like I I was I was loving it. I was loving parts of it. I was liking the adulation, you know. And I think that when I say that I I became a bit too big for my boots, I just mean that like you start believing your hype. Of course, you know what I mean. Because none of it's real. It's yeah. none of it is real. I mean, you know, that's the one thing I've learned having been through that machine and out the other side. And actually, I remember my dad said at the time, "Don't believe the hype." Don't believe the, the good stuff that people say about you and don't believe the bad stuff. You know, <laughs> that is that was a really good piece of advice that I didn't really take on board until much later, mm. you know, uh, and then you look back on it. You're like, yeah, I should have listened to that. Mm. Um, it's a it's a very strange thing. Um, you, I, I, When it first happens, you suddenly realize that your life is suddenly it's not your own anymore, yeah. you know, yeah. Um I, as I said earlier, like, like you couldn't, I couldn't go out of even out of my house. I couldn't even step out the front door of my house um, without people being there and wanting, you know, into autographs or whatever it was, or wanting a piece of you, you know. So I found myself like <laughs> in the boot of my mum's car, like sneaking out of the house just to, to I don't know, go out and do something or whatever. But even when I did go out and do something, I couldn't go to the cinema. I couldn't go to the pub. I couldn't fucking go to to Woolworths you know what I mean it was 
it was just because I was such a, a famous face at that time that no matter what I did or where I went, I had to have somebody with me for protection. <laughs> so it's a, I mean, life is very, very different now. And that doesn't last in, in its kind of, you know, the, the craziness of that doesn't last. Um, and then there is, there always is another side to it, you know, but, but yeah, it's, it was a crazy, crazy time. Seeing the, the, the aftermath of your, your instant success obviously came, and I hope I'm using the right word here, frustration for you, um, because it didn't quite go, I guess, as according to plan. Um, did you ever feel that it was just slipping away from you? Yeah, there was a time. Um, so when I, when even as quickly as putting a second single out, which, you know, didn't, didn't do really as well, it could get in top 40 and everything. But I mean, obviously that after a massive number one like that, um, it was a, it was a disappointment uh, in, from the record company's point of view. And uh, you could, I could feel that, you know, um, and literally by the time I was, you know, looking to put my second album out, I was just about to, to do that. Uh, they dropped me. Yeah, I wasn't told that was going to happen, or even that that was even a possibility of happening anytime soon. Um, and uh, you know, there was a time there um, that, I mean, you know what it's like when you're promoting records. You 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 have a team of people around you that feel like family, you know, mm. you travel with the same, the record company girls, the promotion people and everything else. And uh, I mean, for those kind of three years, they were very much part of my, part of my life, you know, and then suddenly uh, everything was gone and I couldn't even get them on the phone, yeah. you know, and that was, that was really, really tough for me. Um, Did you feel lost? You know, yeah, totally lost. Um, like I, I, I I wasn't even myself anymore. You know, it's, it's like I hadn't, because I was so young and I'm sure you were young too. Um, you're not formed. You don't, you don't even know yourself, you know? So, so my kind of internal, uh, you know, description of myself would be very, very different during that kind of wild time to straight afterwards. Cause I suddenly thought, Oh, I've actually got to discover myself because I, I hadn't been introduced to, to me at that point. I was still a kid, mm. you know. Um, it's it's a very, very difficult thing to go through that. It feels like you've been kind of wrung out uh, and uh, left out to dry in a way. You see, that that's the one thing that I struggled with particularly, is that yeah. people don't understand the backlash. Unless mm. they've actually been in that situation, they just, they don't get it. They don't understand it. They never will. Um, and it... I found it particularly difficult and I found it quite troubling, if I'm being honest, for quite a few years until I was able to get myself back on my feet. Mm. Were you able to turn to anybody for comfort? Yes. Um, now, I obviously had my family, yeah. um, which was everything to me. Um, my brother was was a rock for me through, that, through those years. Um, but, you know, I... I still kind of like fell, you know, um, into places that I, I, I shouldn't have gone. I got into bit, bit into drugs and, and stuff like that. Cause it's an escape, you know, to, you just kind of, it, 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 for, you want to forget what's actually happening. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, so yeah, there, there was, there were dark times. Um, but I had my, my brother, my family, eventually I met my wife, um, you know, and, uh, that and actually that wasn't too long after that i was only like 20 just getting on for 23 when i met my wife we've been together for 27 years now um thank god she came along because uh you know i was financially in the hole uh i was lost really uh didn't really know what the hell i wanted to do well obviously i know i wanted to do music but like i didn't know how to do it. i thought my career was over i thought a washed up pop star at 23 you know I want to pick up on something that you just said there about what am I going to do next? So yeah. again, just, um, just indulge me for a moment. I remember that it got to a stage where I needed to earn money. I was rapidly running out. The mm. bills were stacking up. I was getting into debt and I genuinely didn't know what to do next. 
and I remember, and I've, I, this is something I don't think I'll ever, ever forget. I knew I just had to go out and get a job. So yeah. I went to a place called the Hatfield Galleria, which is not far from where I used to live. It's an old shopping centre that goes up across the old A1 near Welling Garden City. And I, I walked it, into yeah. what was an old sports retail shop. Mm. And I walked in and immediately I could see the two young shop assistants whispering. And I was like, oh God, here we go. And I asked to see the manager. And the manager came out and immediately I could see starstruck. And I was like, oh God, this, is, this was horrific. And I said to her, do you need any shop assistants? I'm looking for a job. And the bemusement and the bewilderment on her face is something that is etched in my memory. And I swear, Chesney, her words will stay with me forever. She said to me, I can't give you a job. You're a famous pop star. And I just turned about, got in the car, went home. And I swear to God, and I'm not afraid to say this, I just started crying. And I couldn't stop. I, I couldn't stop. Mm. And I just thought, what am I going to do? And eventually I got very lucky because I got a job ironically in a, in a small leisure club, just around the corner from the old top of the pop studio in Elstree. <laughs> um, and I swear it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me because it got me back earning money. It gave me a purpose in life. It got me out of bed. Did there ever come a time when you thought to yourself, I just need to go and get a job. That crossed my mind on many, many occasions. Um, but I, I never went there. Uh, and for the reasons that you just described, I mean, I just couldn't imagine putting myself in that position. Like, you know, <laughs> it's, like, it's horrific. I'll give you a job. You're the one and only. <laughs> I don't know. It's just like, what? Well, it's weird, isn't it? Um, yeah, people just yeah. think that, you know, if you're famous, you're a millionaire, you know. So I yeah. always said that I was going to write my the title of my biography would be Fame No Fortune. <laughs> <laughs> But it's just the way that people think, you know, it's like, yeah, I've got a mortgage too, <laughs> you know, um, but I am very lucky um, that I never had to do that. Um, I never, I was in a hole financially, don't get me wrong. I really did get myself in a proper hole. And there were times when I'm like, I'm going to have, I can't, I, how do I make money here? I can't do it. Um, and that went on for a very, very long time, actually. Um, it wasn't till kind of, well, I think it was about four years after, four or five years after, um, that I I never stopped uh, writing music. I never stopped, and I never stopped playing either. Um, but I did it as a band. I, I, you know, I tried. I I went. Okay, I said right now I'm going to just kind of do what I really wanted to do musically. And I went and I wrote a bunch of great songs and and uh, formed a band and did that. And I, I I tried to make it that way. Obviously, that didn't work out. But what saved me was I got a publishing deal Okay. Um, for, for my songs. Um, so that's when I, I kind of, all that kind of like uh, belief that I was talking about as a young man that had kind of dwindled to thinking I'm no good, I'm not good enough, I'm too old, whatever it is, all those things that your little chatty friend tells you all the time, you know. Um, when somebody, you know, felt like I was worthy enough for them to to give, a, you know, money for my songs, I, I was like, okay, so so maybe I am okay. Maybe I am. Maybe I can do this, you know, and it kind of gave me that belief again. Um, and I started, you know, writing in earnest and, and uh, you know, just kept going, kept going, writing, 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 playing gigs, playing gigs. I moved to, to New York for a while with a band. None of this ever came to anything, <laughs> you know, not really. I had a couple of, you know, I ended up starting to, to write um, and produce for other artists. Like I ended up working with, you know, in the early 2000s, I started working with like, hearsay a1 yeah. and young boy bands like uh triple a you know that, that kind of thing and i and i started doing okay with that and i never really earned a living out of it but yeah but you had a purpose but, and i think that's the i had a purpose thing. and it and it was music and yeah. and i you know i was still making money out of music uh, you know not a lot um and just about getting by and, and luckily my wife was a very successful model at the time and so i i was a kept man in a way through those years yeah 
<laughs> and uh, and then actually right at the beginning of the turn of the century, I I had this. Um, I hadn't played as me under my name. I hadn't done any gigs under my name for probably seven years or something like that. And I had other band names like Ebb and Fly and, you know, all these different crazy things that I was doing. And then I got an offer from uh, a, a, a promoter that was doing um university circuit. And this is kind of 10 years after the one and only. And um, trying to persuade me to come out and do a couple of gigs as chesney hawks that's him as my friends call him him and uh and i as i said i hadn't played the one and only for years i hadn't done that at all and uh i just thought that no one's gonna know who i am that you know these kids were like you know th they were like 11 when the one and only came out so that no one's gonna remember me you know? and younger than that if it was a fresher ball like they would have been seven years old when the one and only came out you know but what i didn't know was that I was lucky enough to have that, a record that had a set of wings of yeah. its own. And it yeah. just, and I didn't know that it was going off and making connections with people. And it was being kind of handed down like some kind of mantle and it had become like a student anthem. And it was the weirdest thing for me. And I, I turned up at these, at these fresher balls and stuff at the universities. And I was like, I was like a cult figure or something. <laughs> it was so weird. And the record was like, you know, become something more than it was before. It was there. They remembered it when they were a kid. And I don't know, it it was just like another a lease of life. And so when that happened and the those gigs were huge and like it was almost like better than before, you know, like a they were like people with my face on their t shirts and stuff. And it was like, what the hell's going on here? You know, I it was really weird. But I so I never looked back really and then just carried on performing as as me you know and that's what i've been doing ever since and and I, and it's really uh you know it's been amazing i'm you know i still play festivals and things like that and still able to put records out and then i started writing and recording for myself again and i put records out and i'm still doing it now um you know all these years later and still still making it. i've got a new album coming out and then you know this year so yeah which which i've seen which is absolutely fantastic and we'll come to that in just a second but it's just while it's in my head Mm. Um, you, you, there was something you said there, sort of, it's quite prevalent for me. Um, when you talked about the, the sort of four or five years, there was a mm. there, that was that sort of period in your life. Did you ever go through a stage where you distanced yourself from Chesney Hawks? Yes, mm. definitely. I did not want. I didn't want anything to do with it. I didn't, you know, okay. cut my hair um totally different. wearing different kind of grungy clothes i wanted to you know i wanted to get away from the pop thing i turned up to 11 with my guitar i, I thought i was in radiohead <laughs> you know I, my music was rocky uh, it's far away from pop um of course now and again yeah. even at these gigs you know and i'd be playing like camden underworld and places small venues where nobody knew it was me i'm just a band you know and now and again, someone recognized me and like, do the one and only. I mean, and I'm like, fuck off. You know, I I never, <laughs> it's true. I actually had those days. I did. Uh, I didn't, I, I I rebelled against it hugely, swung completely the other way. Yeah, it's funny because I I did exactly the same. For years, I distanced myself from it. If, if people brought mm. it up in conversation, I would, I would quickly turn the conversation to somebody else, to something else. Mm. If somebody recognized me, I would apologize and say that they've, they've mistaken me for somebody else. <laughs> and very much like what you said earlier about how meeting your wife helped change the mindset. I was also very much of that as well. My wife helped change my mindset as well. But what yeah. I find very strange now, Chesney, and I, and I think you'll get this, is, you know, the BBC Five, I think it is. I've been out of the UK for many years now, so I've got no idea what it is. But I think it's BBC Five. are doing reruns of old Top of the Pops. And a few mm. weeks ago, my phone lit up and uh, mm. there was a, a Top of the Pops performance that we had done. And Matthew, who was our singer, lead singer, he sent me on WhatsApp the entire performance. And, and, I, and I, I, I haven't watched it for years and years and years, seen snippets, but I haven't watched the, the, the whole thing for years. And I was like, do you know, it's actually quite good. We're actually quite polished here. Matthew's yeah. vocals are fantastic. But I couldn't relate to it. 
And it was like mm-hmm. I was watching not somebody you anymore. else. Yeah. Do you know what yeah, I mean? I always, I always like, yeah, I always liken it to like looking at a cartoon character. Right. right. <laughs> it's, a, it's really weird to kind of relate your, put yourself in those shoes. Like that, that doesn't even feel like me. Yeah. Even like, you know, facial expressions and things like that. I mean, it's just not me. Yeah. <laughs> it's exactly so weird. Yeah. And I'm, you know, my yeah. kids are now of the age where they're getting intrigued. Um, <laughs> yeah, still yeah. Not, not quite there, but they're getting intrigued and, and they, yeah. they wanted to see it. And I showed it to them and I, I don't know. I, I kind of struggled to tell them about it, if I'm being honest. And mm-hmm. I, but I think that'll come. I think that'll come as they get older, I think. It's just part of your journey, Valley. Yeah. You know, that, that, that's all it is. It was like, it's something that happened to you, you know, as a young man. And, uh, you know, and I think the way, uh, the way I, that's how I explain it to my kids now. It's just something that happened to me in those days. You know, weirdly enough, it's very hard to be kind of you know defined by an, an a two year period in your life when you were nineteen, twenty years old. Right, right. You know, but that's what the press does. The press will define me forever as the one and only Chesney Hawks, and that's it. They don't want they don't want me to be anything else because that's the 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 Chesney Hawks that they know and love and that's what they that's what they want Mm. and i can't you know i couldn't break away i mean i've tried you can't break away from that it's really really difficult (laughs) um so for your kids like i think that's what you say like you know it's just a crazy thing that happened to me when i was young yeah that's what i say to him yeah that's what i say to him it's just something daddy did yeah Yeah. exactly it's not it's not you it's just it's just a part of your journey yeah exactly are you still in touch with the boys yeah, not not as much as 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 we should be in touch. I have to be honest. I I haven't spoken mm. to a couple of lads for many many years. I do speak to Matthew now and then, but not as often yeah. as I should. Um, and it's a shame, really, because we all went on this journey. We all experienced mm. it. We all went through the same shit. Um, we all, mm. you know, we 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 all dealt with it differently. I have to be honest. Um, sure. You know, I wasn't into the fame celebrity nonsense. I hated it. Whereas the others, they loved it. They enjoyed it. They embraced it. Um, so mm-hmm. it was, it was, you know, I was, I was quite stern. I wanted us to be polished. I wanted us to be good. I wanted us to be professional and I wanted mm-hmm. people to like us. So I was, I was quite bossy when it came to our manners and all that sort of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. you know, there's so much I could, I, I, I could look back and go, mm, should have done that differently. Um, which leads me basically mm-hmm. to my, you, you've set it up quite nicely for me. It leads me to my final question for you, because there is one defining <laughs> moment that I do regret, and I don't have many regrets, but I do have one. And one regret is we should have taken control. When I felt it was starting to go Mm. wrong, which was very early, trust me, it was very early. (laughs) I think it was even before the first single was released, I knew Mm. it was going wrong, and I should have been stronger and taken more control. So the question is, if you could have your time again, is there a defining moment or anything that happened that you would like to go back and change? What would it be? It's interesting what you said about your regret there that you should have, you would like to have taken control of your career. Um, and I think, you know, defining moments is, is I couldn't think of a, a defining moment as such as, but, but what you said there, actually, I really relate to. Um, because I put my, my career in the hands of people that I think in hindsight didn't really know what they were doing. Mm. Um, and as far as looking after and a career of long longevity career. Um, so that's what I would change. Actually, I'm very, very similar to you in that respect that I, I wish I'd have, cause I, I take control of everything else, I take control of the music. I took control of, you know, what, how I, wanted to portray myself but i didn't push it i didn't push myself in in that regard i just let i just put it in their hands you know um having said that sorry mate did you have a humbleness about you that you just thought you know they've given me this opportunity and i've got to be grateful because that's how i always felt it's like you know listen they've given you a a once in a a lifetime opportunity here you've got to be grateful just just yeah they're the bosses yeah you know they were the bosses Man, I regret. And in hindsight, no. Yeah, I know. They work for you. Exactly. Now I'm mean, like, no, you. Yeah. 
exactly. exactly. That's the difference. It's a mindset. But we were young, Ali. We were young. Um, but having said that about that, you know, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of things I would have done differently. Uh, you know, little things like, you know, the choice of songs, the choice of, of singles, uh, you know, holding back on some of the promotion. Uh, like, I feel like I, I was fed up with my face, you know, let alone what, what the general public must have thought. But uh, I'm not really into regrets. It's like I don't I don't regret any of the journey and any of the things that happened to me. Um, because all of that shit um, that happened, you know, kind of brought me, you know, I, I saw the ups and downs of the business, you know, it's like, I, I saw, I know what it feels like to be kicked out of the, of the, of the club and, uh, you know, f and find yourself in the, in the curb and on the curb in the rain, you know, I know what that feels like. And I'm really glad I know what that feels like, mm -hmm. you know, because I had to dust myself off and I'm proud of myself for that. And I've been tenacious. Um, and if you don't experience those lows, you know, you won't appreciate when things do go well, you know? Um, so everything that's happened to me, everything, meeting my wife, everything has, has made me the person I am today. Yeah. And you know what, Ali, I'm fucking happy. I'm really happy. Mm. And, um, you know, life is good. I still get to make, uh, my m living out of music. Uh, you know, Roger Daltrey once said to me years ago, um, fancy doing some fancy getting paid for something you like doing, you know, so I, I know how lucky I am and I'm very grateful and humble um, to be able to do that. Mm. Um, but life is a journey, isn't it? And it's like, you, you know, you've got to the one thing's for sure. You're, you're not always going to be on the up. You're not always going to be, you know, having a great time. Things yeah. are going to happen. Shit's yeah. going to happen to you. 100%. And, uh, you know, I'm grateful for it. Yeah, me too. So they're all opportunities. They're all everything. That All those things are opportunities in life to <clears throat> to move on and and uh, and grow, you know, and that's how, that's how I see it. Mm. Mate, it's been absolutely brilliant talking to you. Honestly, I've, I've loved every minute of it. It's been so nice meeting you. And I'm like you. Um, I have, I, I'm deliriously happy with life at the moment <laughs> and, yeah. uh, the, you know, I, I, and I look back on that time with a great deal of fondness, whereas for many yeah. years, I look back on it with, um, spite mm. and hate bitterness. and bitterness. Yeah. yeah. Whereas yeah. now I look back on it and I think, do you know what? It might've been crap in the end, but I was one lucky boy. Um, yeah. And it's just something you did, mate. Yeah, exactly. It was something that I did at the end of the day. If I wasn't in that band, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you now. That's probably true. Yeah, that so is mate, probably true. Thank yeah. you so much. The very best of luck with the new album and the very best of luck for the future. And thanks so much for coming on, pal. Thanks for having me, Ali. This has been great. It's a, You know, I do a lot of podcasts and interviews, but, um, you know, it's really nice to actually talk about something with, with a bit of weight and depth and, and uh, you know, get stuff off your chest. Thank you, mate. <laughs> so thank you. Really appreciate it. Take care. See you soon. All right, mate. Take care, man. Bye now. My thanks to Chesney Hawks. I really hope you enjoyed today's watch. And if you did, I'd be very grateful if you would please consider subscribing to The Accidental Pop Star here on YouTube. It doesn't cost anything. And all it does is help me build the channel going forward and bring you more interviews with pop stars past and present. We're done. I really hope you enjoyed today's watch with Chesney. And I shall see you again very soon for a brand new episode of The Accidental Pop Star. Take care. Bye for now.